Occupied East Jerusalem. It's Ramadan, when the old city is at its most dazzling and most surveilled. Across East Jerusalem, Palestinian presence is under assault. This year, as Ramadan coincided with both Easter and Passover, Israeli forces unleashed horror in the holiest of spaces. Video from inside Al-Aqsa Mosque shows police officers beating people with batons. Violent incidents against Christian communities in Jerusalem increased this year. The excessive use of violence, the surveillance, are a display of Israeli dominance, a reminder that in Jerusalem there is no safe space for Palestinians. Israel claims Jerusalem as its eternal and united capital. Yet in the old city, life remains distinctly Palestinian. Around 35,000 people live inside the city walls. 90% of them are Palestinian. This is where Palestinians come to pray, where they celebrate, socialize and shop. And in moments of unity, shared anger or grief, it's where Palestinians rebel. But Palestinian existence in East Jerusalem is under threat, carefully watched, recorded and restricted. In the old city's narrow streets and alleyways, cameras are inescapable. There are, on average, one to two of them every five meters. As soon as you walk towards the old city, you know, you, you already see police and military presence. You see cameras. You see these relatively new surveillance towers that are equipped with audio sensors, with microphones, with video cameras, with all kinds of different sorts of technologies. And those surround the old city, and those are also found in Sheikh Jarrah, in Silwan, and, uh, and other kinds of Palestinian areas. <laughs> Of course, you don't see the same system of surveillance in the western part of Jerusalem where Jewish Israelis mostly live. You only see this kind of intrusive surveillance on the streets where Palestinians uh, live, uh, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our public spaces. The steps of Damascus Gate, for example. It's a place where people gather, where people celebrate religious holidays. If you just stand on the steps of Damascus Gate, you'll see several of the police watchtowers. People are familiar with the fact that those towers are used for beating and interrogating Palestinians uh, on the spot. The old city is a focal point of protest and resistance, which explains why it's become such a militarized space. Palestinians say they are often intercepted here by Israeli security forces, who seem to know everything about them. It's an unsettling feeling that creates a chilling effect, the sense that you're being constantly watched, even when you've done nothing wrong. The cameras in the city are the tool that they use to track Palestinians and intimidate them. I remember one time I was at Damascus Gate to cover a protest, and maybe half an hour after that protest ended, a squad of the border police asked for my ID and just told me to stop. The leading commander kept saying, we just received a um, note that you are suspicious and we have to check you. They just got told this guy is passing through the area and they just approached me and uh, interrogated me and put me up on the wall just like this and searched me in front of people because they targeted me from the cameras. This is how these techniques play out. Security forces snatch Palestinians after tracking them with facial recognition cameras. Surveillance in Jerusalem is frequently used to identify and incriminate Palestinians, but mysteriously, it is almost never available to absolve them. 
In April, Israeli police shot and killed 26-year-old Mohammed al Asebi here at the chain gate, after police say he tried to reach for an officer's weapon. There are a lot of cameras around the chain gate, but police say there was no CCTV coverage of the incident, no body camera footage either. It's a narrative even former Israeli police commanders have told reporters they find hard to believe. Palestinians say it follows a pattern. In 2020, Israeli police released this edited clip of Meher Zatara, who suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. Zatara had just tried to stab someone when police, quote, neutralized him to stop him posing a threat to others. But new CCTV footage obtained by Israeli newspaper Haaretz shows Zatara close to 10 meters away from police, moving backwards when he was shot more than a dozen times. This unedited video debunks the argument that Zatara posed an immediate threat that justified his execution. When there are moments that might expose Israeli violence, particularly when there is injury or death uh, or, or killing of Palestinians, there's often this claim of, oh, the camera wasn't working or there was some sort of glitch in the system. The surprise element is part of a way to make sure that everyone's always on their best behavior, that everyone's always being policed, everyone's always being surveyed. The very kind of haphazardness or the ad hocness, I think is itself part of the regime of surveillance. Israeli surveillance in Jerusalem props up a policy of what is called Judaization an effort to cement Jewish control over the whole city. Israel occupied and illegally annexed East Jerusalem in 1967. Ever since, the state has suppressed Palestinian sovereignty in the city, while increasing the Jewish-Israeli presence. The boundaries of Jerusalem have kept expanding, as Israel has built dozens of settlements inside and around Palestinian neighborhoods. It's all part of an explicit effort by the government to maintain a solid Jewish majority. One of the areas under threat is Silwan, just south of the Old City, a target of the right-wing settler organization, Elad. Groups like Elad use coercion, manipulation, the law, and a lot of money to try and force Palestinians from their homes. Aman Sumerin and her family have been fighting to keep their home for more than 30 years, a battle they recently won. The creeping dispossession of families like hers would be impossible without surveillance. One reinforces the other. The more settlers that arrive, the more cameras that appear. عندي كاميرا من هون وكاميرا من هون بيسلطوهن على بيتنا يعني دغري فاحنا هنا يعني مكشوفين كثير هم بيراقبونا بيراقبوا شو بنعمل شو بناكل شو بنشرب شو بنساوي شو يعني اي حدا بيدخل علينا مراقبين احنا 24 ساعة منهم. Silwan is located above Elad's flagship settlement project an archaeological site called the City of David. This major tourist attraction is criticized, not just for selectively emphasizing Jewish heritage at the expense of the many other histories buried beneath Silwan streets, but also because the tunneling for the project extends underneath Palestinian homes, making the foundations so unsafe, residents have been forced to leave. In 2009, Israel's Supreme Court rejected a petition to stop the tunneling, saying any damage was, quote, acceptable given the significance of the archaeological discoveries to Israel's heritage. Now, in the years that have followed that, we have seen a sort of uh, exponential increase in cameras in and around Silwan, where you have surveillance tower in the middle of neighborhoods, and then surrounded in the outer edges, you have 
increasing settler homes, which are former Palestinian homes, with cameras pointed inwards towards the Palestinian homes that exist. And so Palestinians in this context are sort of subject to a double panoptic. And from, on the one hand, Israeli police looking outward at them, and on the other hand, Israeli settlers looking inward at them, and Palestinians have to wonder, when can I expect that the Israeli settler is going to take over my home? You can almost forecast that process by virtue of how many cameras are popping up in these locations. Palestinians can see how cameras are used to dispossess and control them. But they also know that their phones are watching them too. We've come to meet Rula Jamal at Palestinian human rights group Al Haq to speak about spyware, powerful Israeli made cyber weapons that have been used to infiltrate the devices of human rights defenders. What do you know about how surveillance has been used against you and, and what kind of information it sought to gather about the activities of Al Haq? I like the question having the part, what do you know? Because we don't know to which extent are these technologies being used. We are still in a process of learning. So what is the work we do and why is it very attractive to such a, a big power in, in the world like the Israeli state? We are an NGO that work on documentation of the violations that are being committed by the Israeli occupation forces. So you can probably understand that no apartheid colonial regime would like their actions to be documented on such a professional level that could lead, lead to a certain accountability. The Israeli government's demonization of Al Haq reached a peak in October 2021. <laughs> That's when Rula Jamal's colleague, a field researcher in Jerusalem, alerted her that something strange was going on with his phone. He comes to my office, I'm his supervisor. He says his phone is acting weird. His friend calls him saying, I have been trying to call you back, but you are not picking up. My colleague tells him, but I never called you. And then he says, no, you did, and he actually takes a screenshot from his phone log, sends it to my colleague, and then my colleague also does the same, and these two logs are different. And that's when he literally panicked because it is, well, it's not normal to, to your phone to be making calls by itself. An investigation eventually revealed Jamal's colleague had been targeted with Pegasus, spyware made by the notorious Israeli company NSO Group. Three days after the hacking, Israel designated Al Haq and five other human rights groups terrorist organizations. Then Al Haq's offices were raided by the Israeli military. The building CCTV recorded some soldiers searching through documents. Others were just there to take trophy photos and group selfies. Al Haq cannot be certain who is responsible for hacking them. What's clear is that their work documenting Israeli war crimes is being monitored and has made them a target. We are worried about falsified evidence because Pegasus is a zero-click technology, which means that you're not required to interact with any message or a link or anything. It just actually enters into your phone without you noticing anything. So if this technology is able to actually falsify an entire interface and an entire log, what else can it do? We have been told that political prisoners, upon their release, uh, one of their exit conversations, which is usually done by an Israeli intelligence officer, they are being explicitly asked to get themselves a smartphone. One of the people that we have spoken to actually um, didn't get a phone the first 10 days, and he was summoned and reminded about getting a phone as soon as possible, or they would get one for him. So there's not even any shame. It's out there, it's in the open, uh, that yes, we are constantly monitoring you and it is your duty to actually go get the device uh, that we use to surveil every single part of your life. 
The Israeli intelligence outfit responsible for this kind of spying is Unit 8200. Based just outside Tel Aviv, the work 8200 does is highly secretive and its recruitment highly selective. Most of the people who work there are 18 to 21 year olds. In a country that likes to brand itself a startup nation, Unit A200 is seen as an incubator of technological talent. Many Israelis aspire to do their military service there with the knowledge that it could later help them land a job at a major tech firm. However, behind the unit's slick, high-tech image is the reality of surveillance work that can be far more sinister. Eli was a lieutenant in the unit. He spoke to us on the condition that we hide his identity. They give you this impression that you're the best of the best. You're told you're defending your country and only select people know the things that you know. And it's kind of mind-boggling how intimate you are with people that are total strangers, sometimes very important people. So it's hard to resist this sense of superiority. And you have a lot of power for an 18-year-old. You can start eavesdropping on someone just because you decided to. You can pass on his name and change his life. So it has this intoxicating feeling of power. The former lieutenant is one of a small group of 8200 veterans who refused to continue their service because, in their words, they no longer wanted to be tools in the deepening military control over Palestinians. The secrecy around 8200 and the intelligence community in general helps it avoid public inspection. It has this image of only collecting information, only preventing terrorism, so on only diminishing violence, not in any way perpetuating it. But that's not true, as we know from other military regimes around the world. Intelligence is an integral part of a forced control over people. It's illegal for Unit 8200 to target Israeli citizens, but not Palestinians. That's because the unit operates in what it calls foreign arena. Iran is considered one arena, Syria another. And then there are Palestinians, as if they were a foreign adversary, not an indigenous occupied population. One of the most effective ways to monitor Palestinians is to turn them against each other by blackmailing them into becoming collaborators. It's a particularly corrosive technique that creates distrust within communities and it relies on finding people's vulnerabilities. You always look for weaknesses. People with psychological difficulties or trust issues, stuff like that. If we have compromising material, we use that in order to force them into cooperation. So, for instance, someone who is homosexual, that is something that can be used against him. Officers are even taught different vocabulary for how to say gay in Arabic to identify these people and pass them on. Also, if someone or their family has a medical problem, we can offer them treatment or prevent them from getting treatment to blackmail cooperation. So any kind of weakness that we can use in order to get this first connection and cooperation. Obviously, once you get that, you put the person at double the risk because now he's a traitor. So you have even more control over him. Every single action that is being taken against Palestinians come under a systematic um, process of dominance and colonization. And if you want to dominate over a certain people and over a certain race, you need to know as much information about who they are, what are their actions, what are their moves, how does the family situation look like. The more information you have, the more power you can have, and the more you understand how to actually be able to break uh, the people that you uh, occupy. Would it surprise you to know that the Israeli intelligence services are trying to build a database of virtually every Palestinian? It wouldn't surprise me, no. And why are they doing that? Like I said, you want to have control. So you have to close in on everybody. You have to have more and more information and you end up having a database with everybody and every face. And of course, nowadays we have the technology, we have the means to collect data in unheard of quantities on everyone. 
the sky's the limit. Unit 8200's operators are always watching, but at a distance from those they target. In Tel Aviv, where they're removed from the consequences of the work they do. But surveillance and intimidation of Palestinians is often more personal. Sometimes it comes in the form of a phone call from an intelligence officer speaking in Arabic, who is at times abusive and threatening, or charming and persuasive. Other times it takes the form of a text message, like the ones Palestinians in Jerusalem received in March, telling them that they'd been classified as participants in violence, and accordingly, Israeli intelligence would hold them accountable. Not all of this happens in the shadows. Some Israeli intelligence officers operate in the open, on social media. Many Israeli intelligence officers have their own social media accounts and channels that they use to actually communicate with people directly, whether it's sending a, a private message to, to people, intimidating them, telling them to remove a certain post, or telling them that they are actually surveilling their accounts. We actually even once uh, had a meeting in, in Jerusalem with different civil society organizations on Zoom. Abu Nidal, Abu Nidal, Law and then suddenly this Zoom call was infiltrated by an officer who said, I am uh, Officer XY and I'm telling you that uh, this meeting will have consequences on, on many of you. The surveillance is closer than people think and the details in our daily lives are being infiltrated and are being violated by these technologies and by actually people just on the other side, listening to every call, looking at every picture, and also have the entire liberty to use this information, to manipulate this information against uh, any Palestinian. How important is surveillance in sustaining Israel's occupation and its apartheid practices? Crucial, essential, couldn't continue one day without intelligence. It's like a deteriorating situation where you have to use more and more force to keep the same level of control. So in the end, it's going to explode. I mean, it cannot keep going. There's a limit to the force you can use. Israel has built a system of total surveillance where military checkpoints and a permit regime combine with facial recognition cameras and algorithms to track Palestinians' movements, deciding where they're allowed to go, restricting the rights and services they have access to. Palestinians are watched by settlers too, looking to take over their homes. Their phones and social media are monitored en masse by units like A200, which seek to exploit weaknesses in Palestinian society. And they are subjected to targeted surveillance, with spyware produced by the likes of NSO. Palestinians are, in every sense, a testing lab for Israel to refine not just new surveillance technologies, but the culture of control that drives them. There is a reason why activists refer to Palestinians and Palestine as a lab for surveillance technologies. And that's because we see some of the logical conclusions to the most egregious forms of uh, technological violence. When we, as Amnesty, refer to automated apartheid, we're referring to the ways in which existing pillars of apartheid are being scaled up and automated through the use of AI technologies and surveillance, a sort of an, an automation of existing form of violence that people are experiencing. It definitely does halt uh, the ambition of the, how vocal I personally want to be. Because at the end of the day, despite the fact that I consider myself to be a, a strong person, it is intimidating. Intimidating and extremely annoying uh, in the sense that um, how dare whoever is actually listening to, to the call or surveilling me or anyone in my surrounding, how dare you infiltrate my life in such a manner. It's extremely violating 
It is very important that we raise awareness not only for Palestinians but everywhere in the world that is this the world that we want to live in? Is this the technologies that we want to pay our tax money to actually develop? Is this a world that we want to create a big brother monitoring everything we say and we do?